Yeah, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Gabriele Santi from uh, Italy. And he's going to talk about uh, the new programming language uh, Topaz, which he is developing. Uh, in the other room uh, is starting about now um, a presentation of a Dutch government organization to promote open source, uh, NOEFA, Nederland Open in Verbinding, in case anyone wants to switch. So Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Gabriele, uh, and I'm writing a programming language, which is a strange thing to do, probably, and uh, I've been asked to come here to present it, and uh, after all, it's in its very early stage, so it's not really, uh, you know, something most people will be interested in. Uh, it's a good opportunity to, you know, let the word out, and, you know, maybe some people might want to check it out in a few months and see how it's going. Do that. Unfortunately, not on my laptop, so this is a bit... Okay, okay so what is Topaz? It is a new programming language. Uh, it started just about six months ago, so it's really uh, in its early stage. Uh, it is an interpreter, uh, however, it, uh, it also has a compiler, and I'll explain why uh, very soon. Uh, um, but the, the main language, you know, the main uh, use is as an interpreter. So uh, It is strongly inspired by Rebel, which probably most of the audience here doesn't know, so I'm sorry about that. And, uh, uh, the first part of the presentation is going to just explain what it is and uh, give a general introduction of it, uh, but that will be a rather short part. Uh, then I will ask for questions, if anyone has questions for me. Uh, the second part of the presentation is going to assume that you know what Rebel is. In that case, you know, most people here might not be interested, might, they, might, you know, they might be bored, Evan. In that case, feel free to have a, you know, uh, uh, go to, to the room or whatever, I don't mind if, you, you know, if you're not interested in the second part. So don't, you know, uh, be free to leave if you think uh, it's going to be boring for you. Uh, it is strongly inspired by Rebel, although it's not compatible with it. It's not just a Rebel clone, it won't run uh, Rebel Split uh, as is. Uh, although it, it's very similar in many ways, so people uh, from the Rebel community might find, uh, find it uh, very familiar, familiar. It currently runs on any JavaScript virtual machine, which means that it basically runs already everywhere. Because any browser has a virtual uh, JavaScript virtual machine. Uh, most uh, mobile devices nowadays have a good JavaScript virtual machine. Uh, you can run JavaScript on the server with things like Node.js and all that. So uh, the, my choice of using JavaScript, even though means that the topaz is very slow right now, uh, but my choice of using JavaScript uh, as a starting point is that it immediately makes it available everywhere and usable everywhere, which is an important uh, goal for me. Uh, but it is not limited to JavaScript, so it's, this is not. Uh, the name actually can, comes from the, the uh, uh, ROM font from, from, from the Amiga, which was called Topaz. Uh, it's also a sort of a pun on uh, Ruby and Perl and so on. Uh, so I, I, I left Python alone because I don't like snakes, so. Uh, it's, uh, you can't say that here. You know, this is the. the I, I the, know, but the I know. I, I am the crazy guy already, so I, you know, it doesn't matter. I, I'm already crazy. So people, you know, won't believe me if I say I don't like snakes. Oh, see, the crazy person doesn't like snakes, so snakes are good. You know, that that's it's, it's okay. Uh, Topaz is written in Topaz, so that means that it also must be able to compile because otherwise, uh, you know, you cannot write an interpreter in itself usually. So that's the reason why it's also it also has a compiler. Uh, and this is very important for me because the fact that it is written in Topaz makes it much easier to not only develop it but also improve it even by users. Because if you decide in the future to learn Topaz and to use it, by knowing Topaz you already know all that you need to know to be able to also improve Topaz and uh, 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 change it for your needs. So it, the, the fact that it is a high level language written in high level language and actually written in itself makes it much easier for people 
to actually uh, contribute to the project, to actually uh, uh, configure it better for their needs or you know, use it whatever they please rather than uh, you know, being uh, tied. And actually this is one of my most, uh, you know, my biggest uh, uh, complaint about Rebel is actually that it's written in C. Which, you know, it, it's common practice to do if you're writing an interpreter, you write it in C because it makes sense. Uh, but it's, it's really a, a pain uh, than to uh, do whatever we did. Uh, it is a paradigm natural uh, language, which means that it doesn't try to convince you that object oriented programming solves all the problems in the world. It doesn't try to convince you that functional programming solves all the problems of the world. Uh, it doesn't try to convince you of anything. You can use it uh, any way you wish. If you are a fan of object oriented programming, you can do object oriented programming in Topaz. If you are a fan of functional programming, you can do functional programming in Topaz. There is a footnote to this, but uh, we might discuss this later, uh, and so on. So it, uh, it actually uh, doesn't try to force you into a specific paradigm, or, 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 uh, which is a thing that most languages do, mostly because a lot of people are convinced that there is only one single way which is object-oriented, and anything else is simply wrong. I disagree, so I do things it. It is multi-platform in a similar way to Hux, which is another language just uh, very similar to JavaScript, Java and syntax, which I don't like, uh, but that also compiles to JavaScript, to Flash, and to other things. And my goal is to do the same thing. Eventually, Topaz will be able to generate not only a web page that runs in a web browser, but also a, a Flash that can run you know, in, in Flash Player, or even you know, C source code that you can compile and add native on your machine, or you know, anything else that I, I, I eventually managed to do. Uh, so it is not just multi-platform in the sense that it runs on different operating systems, but it is multi-platform in the sense that it targets, when compiling, multiple platforms. One of them could be even Java, although I'm personally not interested in that uh, you know, kind of development, but most peop many people are, so many people might want to work on that. Uh, uh, another could be even uh, Microsoft.NET, uh, another could be, you know, uh, I'm definitely interested in also creating a native application for iPhones and all that, uh, or native applications for Android. So there, there is definitely uh, uh, there are definitely many platforms that I'm interested in, and they are platforms in a higher level sense than we're used to. Uh, uh, not platform just in sense of operating system, but also in sense of uh, a language virtual machine and all that. So. Uh, it is, uh, in this sense, my goal to have a generic compiler that can compile to uh, many different target languages, but then you can compile or uh, run in other case. Uh, the license is uh, uh, MIT, so it's the you know, most uh, liberal license you can have. So basically, you, uh, you, know, you can do whatever you want with it. And, you know, I don't really care uh, if you like it, you use it. If you don't like it, you don't use it. Uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not trying trying to conquer the world or become rich or whatever. Uh, if people find it useful, I'm happy. If they don't find it useful, I'm still happy, so <laughs> it's, it's okay. Uh, what about HTML5? Uh, in the uh, web page for Software Freedom Day, the, the logo for Topaz was that, uh, which makes sense because HTML5 is my number one platform I'm targeting. Uh, for the reason I already say, HTML5 is already basically everywhere. So starting from there makes uh, a lot of sense and makes it possible you know, to have a 1.0 uh, version of Topaz that will be able to run already on cell phones, uh, you know, uh, every kind of computer, every kind of operating system. So it is true that Topaz is about HTML5 in this sense, but it is not true that it is, it is limited to HTML5 or it is just about HTML5 because uh, uh, it definitely, you know, I definitely don't want to be only that. Also, it has to be said that right now, uh, aside from running in JavaScript, it doesn't really do anything about HTML5 at all, so it, it's, it's a bit uh, early to have an attached HTML5 uh, logo to, to Topaz, but still, uh, if you are interested in web applications, you might find Topaz interesting in like six months or something like that, depending on my free time, but... Uh, you might, maybe you won't uh, find it interesting right now, but uh, I, I think you might find it interesting uh, in a few months. So uh, 
the only thing I'd like to ask you uh, here is to check it back in a few months and see you know, if you find it interesting. So this is why should I care? Uh, right now there is little reason, uh, but please check it back in a few months. Uh, right now, creating web applications is mostly a nightmare. Mostly because of incompatibility within, within web browser. Mostly because there are many languages uh, that you are uh, uh, you have to uh, deal with when creating a web application. On the server, you might have PHP or you might have Python or you might have something else. On the client, you have JavaScript, you have HTML, and you have CSS. And uh, uh, you might have, have Flash or whatever. So uh, right now, creating a web application, especially a large one, is a nightmare because most of the time you're spending, uh, uh, you're working to fix bugs or work around bugs in browsers or uh, you know complexities that arise to the, from the tools themselves and not from the problem at hand. And uh, I actually spent the past five or so years working on uh, a web application, and I can tell you that you know it's not fun uh, to work on that that sphere and. Uh, there are so many things you you have to support things like Internet Explorer, which is something something that probably Microsoft created just to uh, punish developers. Because I can't imagine another only uh, reason why they would do that. And uh, you know that's not nice. So one of my goal is to uh, turn that into something nice. You know, finally, oh, I want to make a web application. You don't uh, you know you don't feel bad about that. That you oh. I can do it easily, so that, that's one of, of, of uh, ah, um, one thing for people might be might be uh, looking at the video. The, the the presentation is actually available online. Uh, the uh, internet address that was on the first slide. Uh, there is there is a link to this presentation. I'm actually using that from the browser. So uh, uh, you know, if, if from the video it doesn't uh, uh, read well, you can go directly there and see the actual slides on your computer. So uh, my initial goal is definitely web applications, although I, uh, I don't think Thomas will be limited to that. Why Thomas? Why would I do that? Because I need crazy. That's definitely the first reason. And uh, you can definitely say that about anyone that starts writing their own programming language, because you know, for normal people, that makes no sense. Uh, my main goal is, of course, to make my life uh, easier. So I'm not happy with what's already there. So uh, it's not that I want to remain the wheel, because nobody really ever wants to remain the wheel. It's just that I'm not happy with what's there, and I'm trying to make something better. Better according to my own uh, uh, you know, uh, interpretation of the word better, which might not you know, uh, match anyone else. I hope it will, and people will, uh, will like it, but you know, I cannot really, uh, uh, really uh, see in the future and uh, see what other people really want. So I, I, I can uh, say from the beginning that I'm not trying, uh, Topaz was not designed to be popular. I didn't sit there and say, hey, uh, what kind of feature will people like, or what kind of feature will make this language popular among programmers, or what kind of things uh, will make this the number one language in the world. I never uh, uh, stopped to think about that. Uh, one reason is that that immediately leads to making something like, uh, you know, uh, with Java syntax, with you know JavaScript-like, uh, you know, behavior maybe with with you know uh, dynamic like Python with object-oriented and all that, which or it's already there. So it doesn't really make sense to make something that's already there. So I'm, I'm doing something different, and for this reason, uh, being different may mean not being popular. Uh, also, you know, it would be nice if actually. Becomes popular, but uh, so I can I, I can uh, tell you from the start. Uh, I'm not trying to please you. Uh, on the other hand, if you actually like it, I'm going to be very happy. Um, also, another thing uh, I always wanted to experiment with adding some uh, features or playing with this on, on Rebel, which was not uh, possible because Rebel is closed and cannot be modified in any way. So uh, uh, this is also for me a way to play with things. So in in a certain sense. Topaz will always be experimental because you know it is one of my goals. 
However, I don't plan to use it in production, so I'm not saying this to scare people from actually using it. I'm just saying that you know, uh, it is one of my goals to actually play with uh, strange language features or you know, things from uh, uh, obscure language that might be interesting. So my goals are a language that can be both high level and have good performance, which is not easy to do. Uh, I, I haven't achieved that this yet, and it will take some time. Uh, I have some ideas. Uh, some uh, some are uh, uh, definitely uh, you know uh, unconventional. Uh, one of the ideas is to use uh, artificial intelligence in the compiler so that the compiler will be able to perform a number of optimization that uh, cannot be performed in general, but might be performed manually by users. In the you know currently, uh, if you're writing something in C, you maybe you pick at C because you can actually uh, manually uh, uh, optimize. Uh, uh, down to the low level. Uh, I'd I, I love eventually to have the compiler uh, do this kind of stuff for me and uh, automatically figure out what's the best way to, uh, to, to uh, implement, uh, you know, to, to compile a certain function in a specific platform or whatever. Uh, another thing I want to play with is uh, to completely separate uh, the optimization phase from the uh, uh, implementation phase. Because normally what you do is you write a nice elegant function that solves your problem, but that function happens to be very slow. Maybe because you know, it's nice and elegant, it's one line, but it's very slow that way. And then you go there and you have to optimize it, so you have to write a lot of code and you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 actually write it so that it only works for a specific you know, set of, 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 uh, of implementations and doesn't work anywhere else, but it works fast. And if then, after you know, a few years, you need to change the design of the senior application, the optimization is actually working against you. Because now, uh, it's not one line anymore that you could just change easily, but it's a big mess. That It's fast, but it's still a mess. So my idea is, if I can have uh, optimization as a separate uh, uh, phase that doesn't change the original source code, it means that you still have the original source code. You can change it. Of course, if you change it, then the optimization might not be valid anymore. But that's uh, that's also happens normally. If you if you have to change it, you still have to redo the optimization. So that makes sense. But still, you can change it, and even if it becomes slow again, it works. So that that might be an interesting uh, approach and something I want to play with. Um, another goal is, as I say, run anywhere. So definitely inside web browsers because web browsers is what everyone as a uses and there is now a big trend about web applications and all that uh, runs on the web and so the web was not designed for this kind of thing and it, it's a bit of a mess but still that's uh, where everyone is right now so it makes sense uh, to be there because people will pay me to write web applications and you know I have to write them and I'd rather write them in a language I like instead of having to write them in a language I hate for example and of course the goal is to scratch my edges so to do things that I, you know, I, I like having and I've never found in other tools uh, and, you know, and this is a common thing for open source software which you, you, know, you start it and you do it for yourself initially and then it turns out that other people have the same problems and uh, will want to use it and I hope this happens with uh, Topaz. So, uh, as a summary to this uh, introduction, it is in very early stage so right now, you know, I, I can tell you, go to that web page, page that I said at the beginning, and I will post the, put the uh, address again uh, at the end. Uh, but you might not find it interesting anyway right now. So you might want to wait. I hope you will remember it and uh, come back to it in a few months, because then there might be something interesting in it. It was not designed to be popular, like I said. I like the white snakes, so I'm sorry. Uh, in a way, it's always going to be experimental. However, I do plan to use it in production, so it's, uh, this is the summary of what Topaz is, I guess, right now. Uh, this is a general introduction of what Topaz is. I plan to go into the details, technical details, and compare Topaz to Rapper, because that's what's going to interest to uh, Rapper's right now. And the only thing that makes sense at this point, because I don't really have anything, you know, any cool demo to show or whatever, so. Uh, I realize that this might be boring for a general audience, so again, if uh, uh, people that are not from the urban community might want to stop following me here, I will not you know, find it or anything, so feel free 
uh, if you want to go to the other room or whatever. If you stay here, I appreciate that. But uh, any questions so far? Have you heard about Google Dart? Yes, I didn't look into it yet, but I heard about it. And they may have uh, similar uh, goals in the sense of making web applications easier. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a good target for topots, for example, uh, as well as right is a good target for topots. There are many languages that uh, can be a good target for topots. Right now, JavaScript makes sense because it's definitely the most popular. Yeah. If some other language comes out that's better than JavaScript, no. I'm all for it. Is, is Google Dart low level? I only heard about it. It, it was it, published it, Friday, wasn't it? Yeah, what they're saying is that they want to replace JavaScript inside oh, the browser. Right. So I guess it's going to be uh, you know, easier to optimize than JavaScript. So uh, you know, it probably will have strong typing or something like that. I, again, I didn't look into it, so I'm just talking yeah. uh, from uh, my guess. but. It might have things like uh, uh, static typing and you know, uh, easier optimization, but it's probably going to be a high level language running inside the uh, document object model for, for the browser. So it's still uh, not that far away from JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So it, it would really be feasible to combine it with Topaz? Yeah, as I said, my plan is to have Topaz compiled to uh, many different platforms. So if that turns out to be a good language, to take as a target, I would definitely write uh, 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 it as a target. It's not actually uh, the way Thomas is designed. It's not difficult to add a new target language. So, uh, and uh, again, it makes sense for, to use something like Red because Red is uh, uh, runs client side and allows you to, uh, you know, not use the browser at all, but have a simple application that just runs and you know go, go away with all the complexity of web browser and all of that. Uh, you know, there, there are many kind of also, uh, if you look into hacks, they also have uh, uh, a virtual machine that they, you can target, which I think it's called NecoVM, which might be interesting because it, it, it seems to be a lightweight uh, virtual machine that you can use, you know, instead of Java or .NET or something. So, you know, there are many uh, uh, possible uh, targets that are worth investigating. Uh, right now, I'm just uh, focusing on the one that makes most sense for me because it, you know it's just me, so I like the li limited time. It's my free time. It's not you know nobody's paying me to do this, so uh, I have to optimize. Any other questions? Okay, I can move forward to the fun part. Which is fun for me and for maybe for Kai and for Anna, probably not very fun for everyone else, sorry. Uh, Topaz is written in Topaz. This means that there is a compiler that takes the Topaz source code and outputs JavaScript that can be done in Node.js. Currently, I'm using that because it's most common, uh, you know, uh, most uh, 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 easy to use on, on the command line uh, or a web browser. Uh, in, actually, if you go to the link I put at the beginning, you have Topaz running inside there and you can type. Uh, interactively with uh, Topaz and uh, have it run and try it on. This is done by the compilative function. The compilative function gets a block and creates a string which is JavaScript, so it works just like this. The current compiler is a temporary one. Uh, the reason is, of course, I'm writing Topaz in Topaz. That means you have to start somewhere. Because, of course, when I started, there was no topaz, so I couldn't really write topaz in topaz. So, uh, what do you do in this case? There is a phase that is called, uh, by compiler authors, bootstrap, where you use something else, you know, in the old days it used to be uh, assembly language or even machine, machine code, to create the first version of the compiler. Once you have the first version of the compiler, you use the first version to compile the second version, then you use the second version to compile the third version, and so on. This process, of course, is you know, creating a perfect Topaz compiler from scratch using, for example, JavaScript, which is what I did, would have been a, lot, a long, you know, a long and difficult uh, uh, job. And then I would have uh, uh, had to take that, throw it away, and start again. So that wasn't really you know, a good idea. So what I did is I did a very small step at a time and I created a very simple compiler that looked like Topaz, but you know, it was really not like that, and was just enough to get the first version of the, of the Topaz interpreter running, uh, written in Topaz itself. And then I, go, I, I went 
on from there by doing a little step at a time. So what I have right now is not the real topaz compiler that we'll have in the future, but it's something uh, which I call fake topaz because it is, uh, in a sense, it is closer to JavaScript than it is topaz because that makes it easy to make the compiler. So it is uh, still in an uh, intermediary stage when I'm going to reach the point where the real compiler will be there and then I'm completely, uh, you know, uh, I'm done uh, with the bootstrap phase. Uh, I'm actually close to that point in the sense that now the interpreter is powerful enough that I can write the real compiler in it. So uh, I'm going to do that probably, you know, soon, is, uh, as long, you know, as my free time allows that. So I'm, I'm, I'm close to leaving fake topaz uh, behind and going to the, the real uh, version. It is still a topaz dialect. Uh, the term dialect might be unfamiliar to, to non rebels uh, It would take 45 minutes just to explain what a dialect is, and that might not even be enough because uh, if you don't have experience with travel and with using it, understanding why, what is a dialect and why it is different and more powerful than a simple uh, domain specific language like you have, for example, in Ruby or uh, you know, in Scheme or whatever. Uh, it's not simple to explain because it's different from the mainstream. You don't uh, you don't find this in textbooks, and so uh, I cannot explain it now. I don't have enough time to do that. So, uh, in, in the next talk, uh, uh, a dialect will be shown that should be recognizable because it's a dialect for GTK. So, yes. uh, if you want the uh, if you want an example, yeah, more please more examples uh, stay will be, tuned. Will be during uh, another stuff definitely. So it can be loaded and processed by Topaz itself, which is a user thing. And in fact, the goal of Topaz is, is one block that gets passed to compile. So we have, we have the compile function, uh, the, the compiler, uh, the, the, the compiling script, script just gathers all uh, source files, uh, processes them in some way, and uh, uh, calls compile to generate the output JavaScript. So what I wanted to do is to show you this process. This is flash for you. Do we have any way to out of this? We don't. F11. Yeah, F11 basically. Uh, Flash takes over the keyboard events, yeah. so the browser doesn't get them anymore. And I don't have, yeah, probably I'll tab my something. No, it gets back there. Uh, let's see if I do this. Okay. I wanted to show you this, which is the script that compiles, that creates topaz.js. So it basically starts from gathering pieces from the various source files. Uh, it creates a few uh, macros that are then used inside these files. Uh, it collects all the data types files. It, you know, it creates a huge block this way. It adds a few things like the, the uh, this is the uh, read, uh, evaluate, evaluate, print loop, uh, like this. Gabriella, uh, could, could you try to speak a, a bit more towards the camera? Yes. Uh, I, I want to go very quickly on this, so it's, it's going to be just a second. Uh, the the uh, end is just this line, which is the one I want to show. You have the interpreter, which is the block with all the source code. Uh, it is bound uh, to a context which has a number of macros and other things. The compile function is called, you create a string, and it's saved to Topaz.js. So uh, this is the way the, the uh, Topaz is built right now. Let's see if we can go back to the presentation. Okay, maybe if I do just this. No. 
Ah, so it replaced. Okay, so now I should be able to do this. Oh. Okay, sorry about all this. No, it doesn't want to. Okay, let's read it this way. I hope it won't be. This is the current list of data types. Uh, again, this is something that will be uh, familiar only to the uh, people from the Rebel community. Uh, it, of course, it's not the complete list yet. I have a lot of work to do, but there is a lot of, uh, of stuff already that, uh, that's useful. Uh, this is the list of current native functions. Uh, uh, some of them are actually temporary and they will go away or become uh, mezzanine or whatever in the future. Uh, uh, but this is the way it looks right now. And this is the list of current mezzanines, which is not a lot, because I haven't uh, done much work here. Uh, so this is the, the thing I wanted to talk most. Uh, you know, this is the second part, basically. How does Tobas compare to Rebel? Uh, I'm just going to present the main and uh, strongest differences. Uh, these are not the only differences, it's just the ones that are already implemented and already work. And uh, nothing is set to stone at this point. There is still definitely uh, 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 a lot of work to do and I might change my mind on a lot of things, but you know, this is the current status of things and uh, this is some of the ideas I had and uh, I put in top of, uh, at this point. Uh, the context type is similar to Rebel's object. So while Rebel has an, an internal context type and then an object type, which is just uh, a context with a wrapper around it, uh, Topaz just has context which is used uh, uh, you know, also in, in, inside, and it's available outside and has a similar uh, semantic to Rebel's object, so you can bind to it and it's created in a similar way. And instead of having uh, a special self word, which is set by default to itself, it has this context, which is self to itself, and the reason is that this is available everywhere. So if you are in a function, you have available this context, which is the function context, for example. And that is useful in, in, in many ways. And it makes more sense to make it this context rather than itself. It will also make more sense in the future because you will have a, this module, uh, which is the current module, for example, and things like that. So uh, uh, I think this naming is more uh, uh, readable and makes more sense than just using self, which is more generic and uh, you know, you don't know if you're referring to self as you know, the current function or the current module or whatever, this way it's more uh, readable in my opinion. In, in other ways, it's very much like Rebel's object, so there's not much luck here. Uh, op is the uh, value for operators and it's also very similar to Rebel with the exception that any function that takes exactly two arguments can be made in an op. So as long as you have a function either native or mezzanine, you can make an op for it uh, and, uh, and use it as an infix operator uh, in same way as in Rebel. Uh, uh, now, the fact that you can doesn't mean that you should a lot in the sense that this can be a nightmare from the readability point of view. So it's okay if your operator is uh, something that is very that really stands out as an operator rather than just a function call because there is no other way otherwise to, 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 uh, to, uh, to see them that structure an operator there, not a function call. So it, it works for things like plus or uh, you know, uh, minus, uh, things like that. It works well. In some cases, uh, well, one of my uh, naming conventions is to always use verbs for functions. So if you see something that is not a verb, it might be an op. And that one that really makes sense and that I'm using that though. Uh, you know, it doesn't have a lot of visual cues, is in, because in Rebel you have is and in as a function, and you write in context word, uh, while in Topaz you have in as an operator, so you can write uh, word in context, which makes sense because the most useful, most uh, common used uh, uh, item is if word in context and something, and it reads much better this way. So, um, it's, I hope it will work well in practice. Number, this is a problem of the current implementation and of using JavaScript. JavaScript doesn't have a distinction between integer number and floating point numbers. 
it's just a number for JavaScript. So uh, at this point, I can do, I can dis distinguish them in double header. So I don't have integer or decimal. I only have number, and uh, you know it works both as both uh, in both cases. And you know it's just something that will eventually uh, go away, and then we will have integer and decimal for for the only reason that. That way, it's much easier to do optimizations in the end. If I'm targeting C, for example, knowing that something is an integer, not a floating point, uh, makes things much easier. And the JavaScript virtual machines have to do a lot of complicated stuff to make things fast, uh, just because of this design decision from the, the author of JavaScript. So which, you know, it made sense in a way, but it's really not uh, good from a compiler point of view. So it's probably one of the things that Google Dart is going to change. I, I guess so, I guess so, so, yes. so it would be uh, Topaz on Google Dart might run faster. Most likely, most likely, yes. Yeah, I get, uh, at this point I'm not really worried about performance at all right now, uh, because I have to get it done first. Uh, but I have many ideas on how to make it fast eventually and uh, produce uh, efficient code. and. Uh, so I will need things like separation between integer and floating point and even other, uh, many other types because the more types you have, the more specific you can be when you're compiling and all that. So, but right now, uh, you have to live with this uh, small limitation. Uh, expression is another temporary type that I'm just using in the current uh, compiler to represent uh, a compiled expression before it gets translated to JavaScript itself. So the compiler internally creates uh, you know, parses the, the dialect, it creates an expression, and then in the end this expression is translated to, to JavaScript source code. Uh, uh, this type uh, re represents and allows access to these internal expressions from the interpreters, interpreter, and it is used, used inside macros. So you can write interpreter functions that are cal called during compile time and that do something interesting with these expressions and then you know, return them to the, the compiler to use them. So, uh, I use this trick to, to, to allow macros right now. This is, again, stuff that will go away with the real compiler, which will not need this kind of hacks. Uh, so, you know, you can ignore this for now. It's just there because I need it, but won't be in the future. This is one of the uh, big changes between Topaz and Rebel, and it is the object type. Because the ob uh, Topaz object is nothing like uh, Rebel's object. It, it is not a context, so you can bind to it. It is more like uh, Rebel 3 is map, so it's just a map between words and values. Uh, this, will, this makes uh, it possible to make it more lightweight and uh, eventually uh, you, know, you can use it more freely in your code without worrying about performance because a context is usually a bit more expensive. And it also has the addition of JavaScript-like prototype chains, which is the ability to say, okay, this object is a child of this other object and so on, so that if a word is not found in the child object, it can, it can get uh, looked up on the parent object. And this is something that is very useful in practice, and I, was, I had to emulate it in uh, Vid when I was working on Vid on Rebel 3. So, uh, you know, I, I had this feature because it's some, not, not just because JavaScript has it, but because I actually uh, needed it in the past, so it's something that can be useful. Rebel 3 is the uh, new uh, version of Rebel itself. Yes. That, uh, has never been released and probably will never be at this point, I guess. I don't know. We can always hope, but... Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> the other big change is in function, uh, in function specification direct. How you specify function arguments and how functions are called in, uh, in response to that. This function spectacle is quite different from uh, in Topaz compared to Rebel. Uh, uh, Topaz doesn't have refinement, uh, uh, refinement type, so you don't specify options using uh, refinement values in this, in this spec dialect. Instead, you just introduce the options using the options keyword in the spec dialect as a set word. And uh, uh, optional arguments can have default values in topics, which is also something that is very useful. Um, a lot of uh, rubber functions that have uh, optional arguments at the beginning are, are just something like argument any you know, to just set the default or whatever, so that, that's the most common thing you do and it's worth having an interpreter doing it for you. So this is, uh, this is something I found very useful and so I added it. Writer is not defined globally, so you don't have a global native function that's called writer. And uh, it is local to each function, this is actually an idea 
me and Ladislav, uh, actually Ladislav proposed it uh, in 2004 and we discussed it with Carl in 2004 uh, but you know, uh, it actually we haven't discussed it for rubber three, in, but in the end it didn't get implemented. And uh, since each uh, return is local to its own function, it is tied to it, and so there is no need for uh, an option like throw you have in rubber, mm -hmm. because throw is problematic. Because if you have if you make a function that needs throw, then you can't use return inside that function anymore. So you know it, it's, it's a bit uh, of a problem. This problem doesn't exist in, in topics. Carl is uh, Carl Sassendraat, uh, the uh, designer of Rebel, and previously of uh, the Amiga operating system. Uh, also, uh, because it is local to each function, it can take more than one argument. Instead of having uh, rather than be the same for all functions, you can have uh, different specification for each function and have rather than uh, multiple arguments. Uh, what happens if you have more than one argument is that uh, rather actually returns an object uh, back with the name of the arguments itself, so you can easily access it from the color function. And this is useful because what you do in Rebel most of the time is that you either write on a block or you write on an object itself. So you're doing that manually. This is why the interpreter does it for you and it can optimize it uh, eventually when compiling and things like that. So it's, it's a useful way to allow optimization and to make it easier to use this, this common team. Uh, because if you use a block in Rebel, like in Rebel, the, the position uh, are not named, so you have to remember it was one, or was, which was two, which was what, whatever. Oh, uh, I think I forgot to mention. Uh, currently, Topaz is uh, zero indexed, so the first element of a block has index zero. I'm not a fan of that, but it makes life easier right now, and I don't like the zero gap that Rebel has, so I need to find a general solution to that. For right now, uh, we use zero, so first is defined as peak series uh, zero and not peak series one, which is a bit funny, but that's that's what it is. So. Um, in practice, I find the uh, idea of having return returning multiple values to be useful, and I use this very heavily in my parse implementation because parse is currently written as a mezzanine function, and it, it turns out to be very useful this way. And you know, you get rid of a lot of code just because of uh, this property. Uh, it has a special type of return, which is uh, basically a special kind of method function, so it is somewhat special. Uh, uh, one side effect of this thing is that since it's a value, you can pass it around, so you could pass it to another function and then can call it and return from yourself, which is something I don't really support explicitly, but it's a side effect of it being there. You know, it's fast class, and it basically uh, gives you some of the features of continuation. It's not really continuations because it doesn't really, uh, you know, uh, allow you to go back to whatever it was. You were, but uh, it, it allows you to do some tricks that uh, usually are achieved using continuations. We have about uh, five minutes left. Okay. Yeah, you're right. So let's skip a few things. Um, Since that's running up, it's different from Rebel. Uh, basically, I make a decision here, which is uh, the problem in Rebel is that uh, fun uh, functional arguments are, are uh, positional and there is no syntax to separate them. So if you have like four or five arguments for a function, it's very difficult to uh, figure out which is which. So you know you see a word somewhere, and was this the fifth argument or the fourth argument? Was this you know which which is which? So uh, when you have less than four arguments, so one, two, or three arguments, it's okay, it works fine. If you have more, I don't like it. So in that case, the interpreter forces you you to use a different uh, syntax. The same happens when you're using optional arguments. I'm not supporting Rebel's uh, refinement, you know, patentation for arguments that take other than logic uh, uh, values. I might change this in the future. I'm not yet convinced, but you know, this makes sense so far. Uh, um, and it's basically, uh, basically, the function is followed by a literal block that contains the arguments with their names, similar to how you would define an object. So this makes very clear which is which, because the order is not important anymore, and you have the name column and the actual value of the argument. So it's much, much easier to understand. Uh, this was done to improve readability. And I might add an exception in the future for convenience as long as readability is not in paper. This is an example of the uh, function uh, stack, uh, which is, for example, normal. So you have the value, which is the mandatory argument. Then you have the options, uh, some of which have uh, uh, default arguments. So indent as the default argument of an empty string. Uh, uh, you have a limit that can be a number of none, 
and you have only in fact which are logic optional arguments, so they can also be used in the same way in real world impact notation because they, you know, when you use them in impact notation, you just you're just passing through to that. Uh, you can also specify what the function return. In case of natives, this is just for uh, uh, documentation purposes, so that help can tell you what it is that this function returns. If it's uh, an actual uh, user function, this specifies what kind of arguments the return uh, a local function has. So you can say, okay, yeah, that's one argument, that's zero arguments, that's more. These are examples of calling mold, different that way, so you can just mold a value. You can use mold only mold flat like in Rebel. There is a bug here, you can see that mold flat should not have a new line in there. Uh, or if you want to specify many options, you just say mold options and then use a, a, a literal block with value, which is a value limit 7, for example, or you know, you can uh, uh, I'll use a shortcut for logic. If you say only, it's the same as saying only in column true. So this is just because it's common to use to specify, to pass a plan, and this is why it's much easier to, to read. So this is, uh, uh, you know, it's more verbose, but it's much more readable in the end, and especially if with function with a lot of arguments, it makes sense. My doubt is, in a case like this, when you're just passing a limit, and it's a, a bit, a lot verbose to add, to add options and value and all that, so I might eventually add a shortcut for this case here with just the, the model argument and one option, something like that. But right now, it's, it's like this. Uh, more details can be found in the comments of that file, so you can go there and uh, look in the comments and there are more explanations. Uh, there are quick notes about the functions. Uh, uh, for example, I don't have, and I don't really plan to add special arguments, so you can't rewrite for each word, you need to use lit word. Uh, I might figure out a way to, to make this easier to type, but it's not a big problem. Uh, I'm using a slightly different uh, uh, naming convention like length of instead of length question mark. I use the question mark only for uh, functional return boolean. Uh, try actually takes three arguments, which is a block, the uh, a word and another block, then the third block is called is uh, is evaluated if there is an error. This solves one problem that Rebel has with try and also another thing we spend a lot of time me and Lads love and discussing with Carl that never got fixed. Uh, I have an apply function, which is much more uh, powerful, in my opinion, than what is in Rebel 3. Uh, it can even grab the arguments from a context, so you can say, uh, uh, apply this function to this context inside another function, and it, it will automatically grab the arguments for that, which is very uh, handy if you're making a wrapper function for another function. For example, the case of append with insert, if insert has 10 uh, refinements, and you want to add those 10 refinements in, 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 in append, you don't need to actually list them, you can just uh, apply the, with the context itself. And, and there's also a, a, a mode which is apply only, which is more similar to what uh, Rebel 3 does and allows you to pass a row block. Uh, why the force to call it all on the pass the condition argument, which is a thing very commonly done, and this saves a lot of typing, and I find it useful. Uh, this is a set effect of uh, the way optional arguments work. I cannot do switch slash default, so I have just function which is switch and switch. Uh, dash default, which is also easy to type, so I don't mind at this point. Uh, same thing, I can do copy parts, so I can copy slides, uh, arrows are more like R3, and so on. Uh, are, are slices uh, double indexes? Uh, slice is like copy part or whatever. But can you, uh, is there a slice type that defines... Not yet, but I might. Begin and I might add that, I, I might add that, that in the future. I don't add that yet. Okay, cool. Uh, in topics, I don't have just parse, uh, because I have parse, which is, however, more specific than what it is in Rebel. It can do a more specific thing, which is to actually parse data from a source, so you have a string or a block, and you extract data from there to construct another kind of data structure, which could be a bigger object or a tree or whatever. Interpreting straight is, is a tailor to actually creating direct interpreters and uh, will offer things like you know, uh, loop functions and defining custom functions in a like, much easier way. Uh, basically, the advantage of being more specific is that you can do things like this, which doing in Rebel is not uh, trivial, which is the object keyword, which just makes an object with what you say. So it matches numbers and it creates uh, a tree of objects for you automatically. Also, collect, which just collects what you keep. So you can say, keep the first number and don't keep the second, so you only keep the, you know, the odd numbers this way. And this makes it very easy to implement compose just in parts. If you try to do this in Rebel, it's 
a bit more complicated because you have to keep track of the stack. You know, if you have uh, nested blocks and you need to support deep, uh, you know, you, you have, uh, it's a bit more code. It's not uh, very difficult, but there's a lot more code, but it's just a collect uh, with my pass. So uh, I, I think it's pretty easy to, to read this way. Uh, what's next? Uh, I need to add a test suite. Uh, suite. Right now I have uh, a, a script that just does a bunch of text and I have to look at the results to see if it makes sense. I think the actual time I don't have time to explain what it is. Uh, right in the real compiler, or compiler of course, and you know a lot more stuff. So there's quite a lot of stuff to do. Uh, that's all for now. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, you can always reach me at my uh, address or later you know, if you want to just ask me something. Uh, you can go here and find these slides as well, as well as the ability to try to pop that in your browser without installing anything. And this is where the source code is. Thank you. No questions? No questions. If you want, uh...